All right, everybody, it is December 6th, 2022, and if it's Tuesday, that can only mean one thing. It's time for Comic Book School Live. That's because we own Tuesdays, and we're here to talk with you about the craft and business of making comics, but we have a little bit of a twist for you today because we're going to be going into comics and movies. That's right, comics and movies, things that are naturally working together to entertain you, inform you, and engage you at all times. And speaking about entertaining, informing, and engaging, I'd like to bring on my co-host and my pal, Mike the Knife Fasolo. Mike. Hey. Mike, I got to just tell you, you know, I think um, I um, the lack of symmetry in your background <laughs> hurts me. It well, hurts. You know, you I have many OCDs, Mike. I have many OCDs. <laughs> the fact that your sweatshirt is a little, I see a little bit more red. You got that towel thing hanging behind you. I don't even, is that a towel rack? It's a... Uh, paper towels? Uh, it's yeah, maybe paper Are you in the bathroom right. or something? Here, Are you in the that? bathroom? How's that? Are you in the bathroom? No. <laughs> I wish I was in the, maybe I'll do the next one for the bathroom. I don't want you to. And then the light switch, it's all I need my Wes Anderson symmetry. Oh wow. It's like a, an old style disco, Mike. <clears throat> so Mike, it, that what you did was very cinematic. And I think fully apropos. We never use the word apropos in anything, do we? I don't think we should. That's not a good word. It's not really a great word. No. But when we think about Hollywood and comics, a lot of times we exchange the types of storytelling. They're both visual storytelling, but comics can sometimes be referenced as very cinematic. And then films can be referenced as comic book-like. These are things that are interchanged frequently. And of course, the rise of comic book entertainment, making it to the big screen, has raised awareness among many people who are living and working in Hollywood. And many different comics become options Hence, many creators are very interested in seeing their work up on the screen. Isn't that right, Mike? Who isn't? I would like to see my work on screen. How, is, how, are, our pitches, right here. how are our pitches going, Mike? <laughs> not going well. <laughs> don't you have an agent? Don't you pay that agent? Uh, I do not have an agent. I have a manager. And he only gets paid when I get paid. When you get paid. Yes. And and we should note, of course, uh, no kidding, Mike Fasolo is a three-time Emmy Award-winning television writer. Did you get paid for all? Do you have to pay for those? No, those, they're free. Those statues? They're free. They they give them to you for real? They, they, they have a whole table full of them. And you can just go you and you take just whichever pay. one you want. Does your name on it? Uh, no, they send you that plaque later. You got to put it on yourself. You got it. This is like some assembly required. Yeah, they give, like you, like they give you two little screws and a screwdriver and you got to screw it in. Because what they. Because they don't. I mean, I guess they should know who's going to win, but they just have. The, yeah, I guess they don't want to. Really and they surprise. send you the plaque that you just wrap around. So, Mike, I figure that everybody in Hollywood knows everybody else. Yeah. So I, I, <laughs> I brought you on to talk with our guest, who is a. Uh, a famous movie director uh, who's made some actually really cool films. And I just thought you guys probably know each other, right? Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Everybody, everybody knows, knows everybody. Other. All kidding aside, um, I want to bring on a director um, who is also a comic book creator and just recently came out with a graphic novel from Dark Horse Comics. Please welcome S. Craig Zoller. Hey, thanks for having me on the on the program. And thanks for coming. Now we should be calling you Zoller, right? Uh, yeah, I, I just like the name more. It's not it's not out of any any formality. Uh, it's said I'm I'm a metalhead. You can call me dude if if Zoller's too formal. But uh, yeah, I just like my last name more than uh, Craig, which is my middle name in any case. You know, uh, it's funny it's because when the PR you person, well, when the PR person sent over the kit and was like, "Oh, Zoller," and I thought, like, "Oh, wow, that's." She just called him by his last name, and I just went back to Craig, and then you signed it as Zoller. So, and and then I looked on Twitter; everybody calls you Zoller. I, I just like the name more. It, it isn't out of any formality. I, I certainly have a, a number of people in my life who call me Z or Z Man or something or, or or something akin to that. I think if you have a name with a Z in it, people gravitate towards it. And you would think with a name like Fasolo, it would be easy to pronounce and call you Fasolo. Except we had that one. Announcer that time who couldn't get your name right, Faz, Faz, right? She was Fazla. like, Faz, we're like, there's a no in there. 
a solo. You, it's very phonetic. But um, so, Craig uh, Zoller, obviously, um, you are a huge hit in Hollywood. In fact, you showed up on my HBO. I was watching your movie and I did not know who you were. And then I looked and realized that you had directed the movie I was actively watching, which was the uh, Hollywood masterpiece Dragged Across Concrete. And thanks for the kind words. And then I looked you up and you do everything. So I'm going to do a little This Is Your Life so that people have a little bit of context about what we're about to get into with your new graphic novel. And just uh, just for placement, uh, Mike, you're in sunny California, right? I'm in sunny California. What's the weather like there, Mike? It is not sunny today. <laughs> no. All right. Zoller, where are you? You're you're by me, right? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, mid, Midtown East. Uh, and it is it is drizzling right now here. Is it drizzling where you are? It is miserable here. <laughs> okay. That's the technical. Yeah, term. Yeah, it's misery, but it's 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 drizzling. It's not. It's 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 a it's a it's a good day to talk online. It sure is. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna show uh, a little bit of Zoller's work, which um, I have to tell you, you are prolific. But that's part of what we're going to get into. So uh, the way we got in the door to speak with you is you've just published a massive graphic novel, some 200 pages, I think, 192 pages of story called organisms from an ancient cosmos. We'll have a couple of pages to show from that, but I think just for a little bit of context, um, Zoller is uh, known uh, for three films that you wrote and directed, and you did write a, a fourth, I think. But um, uh, Vince Vaughn starred in this, Jennifer Carpenter, who apparently came back, Don Johnson, who came back for your current last film, which I just saw. So you had Vince Vaughn in Brawl and Cell Block 99, um, one of our American treasures here uh, in Bone Tomahawk. Literally, this, can, is this guy bad in any movie? I mean, he's great in everything. Um, been watching him for my whole life. And then this, which I have to tell you, I got, when I saw Vince Vaughn and Mel Gibson, I was like, all right, I'm in. And I never heard of it, thought it was a fantastic title. It is one of the most disturbing and compelling movie. It's like you can't look away kind of movie. It pulls through. It's over two and a half hours. It's fantastic all the way through. It's a, I would declare right here on Comic Book School Live, a new cult classic. But that's not it. See, Zoller doesn't just stop making multi million dollar movies and getting on HBO. He's also a music recording artist. He's got some music coming out. Uh, he's a heavy metal guy. And of course, uh, binary reptile. Everybody knows the binary reptile. Nobody knows the binary reptile. That's a synthesizer project. This is um, Realm Builder. This is my doom metal band, and it's the guy uh, Jeff Harriet is my partner in that band, and also in Binary Reptile. And we uh, together we wrote all the music for all three of those movies, including the songs that the OJ's uh, sing for Brawl and Cell Block Ninety Nine and Dragged Across Concrete. Certainly, working with the OJ's was a it's a, it's a dream come true, except the dream I never dared dream. Like that was something really surpassing anything I thought I might do to work with guys like that. Now, but Zoller, it's, if we're going to get through your portfolio of work, we're going to need a full three hours. So we're just going to have to <laughs> breeze through this. It's 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 a little bit long. Um, you are also a novelist. Um, I'm just showing one of them, but you've written several novels. Mm -hmm. And also, this is not your very first graphic novel. This is your second graphic novel. Another work of just, it's just unbelievable how much work you get accomplished. We're going to be asking you that in a minute. Um, but I wanted to just give a quick preview of the organisms from an ancient cosmos uh, by Dark Horse. Coming, I think it's currently out now, isn't it? It actually comes out today. Today is the day. If, 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 if you had pre-ordered it, it would be landing today. But as of today, it's available um, you know, everywhere and, uh, comic stores got it a little bit earlier because that's the deal they have set up, which is obviously a cool thing to try and keep the comic stores, uh, alive and give them an edge on, uh, having stuff early in an exclusive way. So the, so the, the, the graphic novel landed at, at shops earlier than today, but today, like you can just go on Amazon and get it or, or, you know, wherever, wherever you buy comics. So I would describe this as a mind-bending sci-fi epic that um, tr 
it just covers so much. There are so many characters. They're so deep. And I, I have to tell you, you're a great writer of dialogue. But I wanted to give people a little peek inside before we got started. So these are actual pages. Uh, now, you wrote and draw, drew everything, Adam Every. Dollar? Yeah. Pencil. Do you it all out yourself or do you? Lettered, do lettered, a, a, absolutely everything. It, I, I can get into process whenever you want. I, I, are you just going to give a little preview now or do you want me yeah, to Yeah, I just want to give a little preview. I want to give people some orientation. This is an epic uh, sci-fi tale, uh, big, like, big action movie type of movie that you would see, a summer tent pole movie. Um, but lots and lots of heart and depth with the characters and certainly... Um, a fantastic story, and as I noted, uh, you're you. a terrific writer of dialogue. Not surprising that you're you're a, a prolific screenwriter. So, Zoller, how do you describe this story without giving it away? Because I I will tell you, pre pre prior to the uh, show starting, I showed him what uh, slides I was going to show him, and there was a scene that I really that really resonated with me. And Zoller, tell him what 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 we did. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I I asked him to refrain from something that that might be that might be a spoiler. I'm I'm super protective of my work, and and I and I told uh, uh, Buddy prior to this, like it is uh, people who have cut the previews for my movies. There, it's, it's usually a whole lot of back and forth because they want to reveal a lot of things that they spark to. But I mean, again, how many how many reviews of Bone Tomahawk did I read where they felt compelled to spoil stuff that happens? Uh, 90 minutes into that movie because it's something they spark you. So I understand the impulse. You want to talk about the stuff that you connect with, uh, but I'm just protective as a creator and insofar as that stuff goes. And, and you know what, Mike? I, 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 did, on. I, I pulled it because I really did feel like it was a good, surprising, unexpected twist um, that in a story that just continued to twist. And I didn't want to give it away. I don't, that's not what we do at comic book school. We talk about the process, right, Mike? You can't spoil things, bud. Can't spoil. So, Zoller, before we go too far, and then we want to get into the movies and what the parallels between uh, sure. filmmaking and comics, but just in a nutshell, what is the graphic novel about? Uh, the graphic novel is about uh, a day when an unexpected uh, alien craft materializes uh, on Earth. And, uh, you know, the ripples from that event... Uh, militaries jointly over the world engaging it, and then how it affects a number of people's lives and the repercussions of that encounter, and then the concern that this might be the first of many, and the people who will put their heads in the sand, and the people who will not, and whose lives were irre irrevocably changed uh, by that event. And you follow a number of different protagonists uh, as they deal with this and try and motivate other people to deal with it, and just the, the obstacles they face. And, and certainly the trajectory of uh, one of the protagonists in particular, I think, is, is not something you are, you are likely to come across elsewhere. And it's the kind of stuff I really enjoy doing and, and dealing with uh, morally gray characters and, and uh, ambiguous characters where you have, where the audience has a, a complicated relationship with, with, the, with that person. So it is, uh, the scale of it is really, really large. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons I decided to do this as a comic rather than write it as a script or write it as a book. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of the piece. Uh, and well, how, much, how much would this movie cost to make? Oh, th this, this would probably be about a, a $250 million movie. This is, the, the scale of this is, uh, is, is certainly beyond, well beyond planetary. Uh, and let me ask you a question because you asked me, uh, do you, would you prefer to be Bud or Buddy? Buddy, never, never, Bud. <laughs> we could, we could just conclude the interview. Okay, fair, fair enough. Fair enough. One, uh, one, one of the songs that that I uh, that I wrote with my songwriting partner and had the OJ's perform is called "Buddy's Business." So, if you want to take that as your theme song going forward, feel free. It's a song Woo. at the end. Uh, Brawling nice. Sunbox Ninety Nine. So, we, so we already we already got your theme song covered. Mike, I got, I already have a song. You have you have a song. I wish I had a song. You have nothing. <laughs> so Zoller, so the first question that comes to mind is the parallel in visual storytelling. Um, can you succinctly help our audience to understand uh, the primary differences? And then if you'd like to include some of the nuances between telling story for the screen and also telling story for the page. 
Well, I, I um, succinctly will be a challenge with any well, answer. Well, we have time. We, we have a whole hour, so. Okay. So, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a visual person. And in, in film school, I studied animation, uh, hand-drawn, and that is actually like the only kind of real drawing training I have. I'm, I'm self-taught as a comic book artist, cartoonist, uh, whatever you want to call it. And, um, but I think visually and, uh, the thing I've done the most and the thing I think I'm the best at is, is writing fiction. So, um, when I'm writing a story, uh, be it a screenplay or a novel or the stories for these comics, which are written out completely, uh, as prose short stories, like fully fleshed out prior to me doing them. Uh, I'm really imagining it. I'm getting into the minds of the characters, uh, whether they're, they're people I would agree with or disagree with, uh, just to understand where they're coming from. And I pre-visualize it. It's one of the reasons I spend so much time on all of my movies, trying to find the right locations and things to match it. And then uh, finding the actors who fit the spots. And it's one of the luxuries uh, and one of the actual joys of comic creating i actually just draw it the way i saw it so it isn't finding the actor who's sort of close uh or reimagining it actually the character that Vince Vaughn plays in dragged across concrete in the original draft of that screenplay he was actually particularly short like there were there were some comments on that and Vince Vaughn is six foot five so obviously that stuff went away when i thought oh he'll be great for that role but there's a bit of a shift when you do that as there is a shift a lot you know like let's say maybe 50% of the, the main characters I cast in a movie are very close to what I imagine, 25% pretty close and 25% different. Uh, but with the comic, uh, the limitations are my limitations as an illustrator, which uh, were certainly significant on the first one and less significant on the second, but those limitations are there. Like I, I feel I got much better between the first and second one, but um, I, you know, I, I have a ways to go to be like, you know, really comp as happy with my um, illustrations as I am with, say, uh, my fiction or my, my prose fiction or my uh, my music. Now, I would imagine that after uh, writing and directing three movies, you're wealthy beyond your wildest dreams, <laughs> literally sh standing in the shower, rubbing hundred dollar bills to clean off. Right. True or false? False. True. Mike, true. tell him. Tell true. him. Absolutely true. So I, I, I do not have one Emmy, much less three. So <laughs> he's coming from a place of privilege that, that I'm not. My movies, my movies have had like kind of borderline supported releases and stuff like that. And they've, they've, I, they've done well. Like the first two were certainly uh, really profitable. But to get that first movie made, you're signing away everything, including your soul and not getting anything, uh, getting very little in return. Like I'm just now. Uh, maybe as of last year, getting any kind of royalties from Bone Tomahawk, uh, whereas the people, uh, the other people involved, uh, made a fair amount of money because they risked it. Like that's how it works. It's not there aren't sour grapes. Like no one believed I could make that movie for um, the amount of money we made. No one believed I could make that movie for less than twelve million dollars, and we made it for one point nine. And the question, um, wait, but the question I have for you, Zoller, is. I'm imagining that you're wildly wealthy. So in my dreams, you, you can are, imagine it. Yeah. To, for me, you're probably richer than me, but you sat down and drew 192 pages. Like I would delegate that to somebody. I'd be like, go, I would go, Mike, go draw this for me. Like why, why with your ability to get movies on a big screen with Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn, why do you commit yourself to this? I mean, and you could have made this really short, but you made, this is an epic. Um, Yes, it is an epic. So restraining myself as a, as a writer isn't isn't one of my strengths. Uh, you'll look like you know you mentioned uh, dragged across concrete in its runtime, and fortunately for me, I had in the contract that the movie could be as long. Uh, oh, the, my only requirements because I had final cut were it has to be two hours and forty minutes or less, and it has to be R rated. So it's R rated. It is I think two hours thirty nine minutes and thirty something seconds. So like just squeaked by. Uh, and, uh, so I let the story take, take me where I want it to go. I know like my original concept for bone tomahawk, people who live, die, people who died, lived. Uh, my original concept with dragged across concrete was completely different for the entire second half. So I follow it. And the same thing happened when I wrote 
the story uh, for Organisms from an Ancient Cosmos, which is a set, is just written wow. out. Those form like a uh, you know like a normal short story, and that's where the story went. In in terms of your other question, in terms of why don't I delegate it? My first interest, the first thing I wanted to do was um, uh, what like in terms of a profession was to be a comic book artist, and uh, and I'd say like that sort of paralleled me wanting to go into animation, but that was an interest I had before. Um, being a movie director or making making movies. So my interest in illustrated art, particularly animation, uh, and I know a, uh, a staggering amount about anime and have been watching it since the 80s, when I've watched bootleg tapes that were not translated and I can do scenes of dialogue for you in Japanese, I won't, but I, but I watched them that many times. And so animation and, and comics, uh, were were really uh, were really Im important to me before I was very into movies. And actually, the first movie I ever saw in the theater, and I, I remember it. I actually have crib memories. I have a really good memory. But I remember I, I it was Peter Pan, and I and I had to have been three or younger because my my parents were still together. And I just remember seeing just the giant drawn characters flying around and the gorgeous animation that is all of that classic Disney stuff. Uh, and so that interest never went away. Uh, and actually, the, once I started having a career as a screenwriter, I was constantly trying to push into writing for animation, uh, including uh, you know, like just shows that shows that I shows that I enjoyed. And uh, and then it, and then at a certain point, I mean, I had a couple of meetings. It started to become more and more oriented towards CG stuff, which uh, they're and they're like I like I love Ratatouille. Um, You're like, right in the camera frame. <laughs> put, a, put a leash on her. <laughs> I, I I love animation, but I don't I don't really have an interest in, in, in and I and there are many CG animated movies that I enjoy, and I don't have an interest in working in that medium. So wait, Zoller, I, I but I still like did you ever say what the heck am I doing? I'm doing a hundred and ninety two pages. I, I, and everything, right? You wrote, drew, lettered. Yeah, every everything ink the, the 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 entire thing, including like I can I'll pull it out, like the because that, that I remember Dark Horse asked at a certain point. So here's the cover, like the letters are drawn on there. That's not even like a paste on or a font. Like I drew that directly on there, and um, uh, no, there it wouldn't be so, like I've had conversations with people in comics. Uh, whose work I really admired, and I just realized at a certain point, Ben Mara being being amongst them, I'm a, I'm a big fan of his work, uh, and I've, I've talked to a number of, of comic book creators whose work I, I really enjoy, and I just realized it wouldn't satisfy uh, what, what I'm looking for to write it and then somebody else draws it. It's not to say I would never do that, um, but I wouldn't do that until I had written and drawn three pieces because I have this strange rule of three works before kind of diverging, but that, that's a whole that's a whole other conversation. But no, the only thing I ever thought of was maybe at some point I should have someone else ink because this would cut my time in half and it would make the book look better. But the first three I'm gonna, you know, like the first two obviously I already wrote and drew and, and, and did absolutely everything in the third one uh, and the third one will be the same. Maybe when I'm doing my fourth, I'll start having conversations with an inker or, or something like that. It, you know, certainly there are many out there who would be able to improve my work. Um, but I also got better by doing it all on my own. So I never thought of giving it over because the end result was I wanted to have that thing that I'd made top to bottom without uh, without any anybody else involved in so yeah. far as uh, Certainly, creative work, process. Working in film, you probably collaborate with so many people. This must be liberating for you as a creator to be able to just make all your own decisions and put what you want on the page. Bingo. That's it. I mean, that, you know, like this is the limitations here are the time I'll put in, which mm -hmm. for this comic was about 2,800 hours. It was, it was from the, the day my girlfriend called me and said, uh, Zoller, you've got to, you, you probably want to start stocking up. It looks like the pandemic situation is going to get more serious. And uh, so it was from the day that that happened uh, up until the uh, the day I got my first vaccine, um, right. so that was the span of it. It was fourteen months. Wow! Uh, 
of of working of working on of working on this piece. So it was in a way it was a really good pandemic project. But I was set to do this before. It wasn't like I decided to do this because of the pandemic. But I missed out on far fewer things, and I had far fewer interruptions because less less stuff was going on, and it was you know very you know obviously safe safe for me to be at home you know, working on the stuff outside of when I, you know, when I would see my girlfriend or an occasional other person. But um, I, the satisfaction comes in doing the whole thing. And, uh, and I, and I think there, and I think that there is a noticeable difference in, and uh, between the quality of art in my first comic and the second, and that's not going to happen. Like, I'm not going to become a better illustrator if I hand it off to somebody. And that's something that has always meant something to me. Like when I, when I was back, when I was a catering chef and playing in death metal bands, uh, anytime I like, and I was starting to get, starting to have a career selling scripts in Hollywood, scripts that that became bathroom reading, none of which were made. I've, I've sold uh, 23, 24, like like Warner Brothers has six scripts of mine alone, just fine toilet reading for them. Mike, how, that- do, you, how do you do that? I, I, I don't know how I convince them to keep buying my stuff after they've already just, dis- they're not making the previous ones. Um, some t- sometimes it's getting an actor attachment. I mean, people, people tended to, people tended to get excitement, um, you know, over, over these things. And, you know, like, so sometimes it's, it's different things going around uh, that help put that help push it forward. But uh, like, you know, like once, once that started happening for me in terms of, I'm selling scripts. I can probably leave my job in the kitchen and um, still play, still playing heavy metal. That didn't go anywhere. Um, and uh, you know, I started uh, like the rewards for me. I think they're telling. Like the, I'll show you one. So I I had just gotten out of the kitchen and I got my three picture deal at Warner Brothers and I and I bought oh, this. Hold on, let's go. Let's go full screen here. Go ahead. What are we looking at? That is that is a page from Watchmen. Of course it is. Of course it is. And, and by the way, at that time, which was maybe 2006, 2005, like, like I can't, but like, I can't believe how inexpensive this, this was. Like you uh, should, if with a Watchman page, you should be living like in a bank vault. No. <laughs> I, into the pool. My, my place is pretty vault. My place is pretty vault. Like, Oh, wait, um, here's a, here's a comment from the audience uh, from Philip Burnett. Clearly yeah. they must find your scripts at least somewhat entertaining. Oh sure, I get. I mean, what what happens is they go in, and then there's a conversation. Like I, you know, like I don't want to like the, detailing the history of all of the A list actors and directors that come and go on my pieces. Well, first off, it'll sound like name dropping, but second, it's pointless. Feel because free, it's feel pointless. free, because we, we don't. Na- I can name drop. I name drop Mike Fasolo. That's it. Yeah, well, obviously, <laughs> drop some names for a Zoller. But so, like, I watch all of them come and go. But like, I mean, you can you can like. It interests the talent. So, so um, I mean, I, I'm proud of the pieces. This isn't to say like, oh, I just shovel that shit out there. I put as much, I, like if I'm doing the piece, I put 100% into it. There's no other, uh, there's no other version for me. And, you know, at a certain point, certainly people in Hollywood, um, uh, I mean, I, I remember a guy who, who later became a president of Warner Brothers, you know, like sort of saying, well, you're not really open to rewriting yourself. Because by the time I finished it, and it goes out there like Bone Tomahawk, Dragged Across Concrete, Brawl and Cell Block 99. Those, that's the draft I sent around. Like I worked on it, I sent it out, and then the movie you're watching is the movie I wrote. Like if you read the scripts, they are they are more accurate to those scripts than than like I'm going to say probably 99% of movies that are out there. Like I am shooting at that target, and there are places where they fall short, and sometimes it's like. A problem on the day I couldn't control, a mistake I made, a mistake somebody else made, whatever the problem was. But that's the target, and it's and it's 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 really really specific. All right, I have two questions for you. Go for it. Question one: I was watching Dragged Across Concrete. I watched it the first time. I was getting through. I was about halfway through, and I noticed that there was very little um, sound track. There's I none. Mean, I don't know how to describe it. What, what's the there's word? No, there's no score. There's no absolutely score. No, no score. score. Just like when I used to go out dating, no score. <laughs> <laughs> Zala, but, so what, what was that a choice? Is that like a directing style? That is absolutely a choice. Uh, Brawl and Cell Block 99 might have two minutes of transitional score, but no score. 
in that way. Bone Tomahawk has a tiny bit of score, and that is because some stuff came short. Like that script, I think, you know, and this is one of the things also, like, I can say, like, organisms from an ancient cosmos, this is better than the story I wrote. Bone Tomahawk, I feel, comes a little bit short compared to the script that I wrote. Interesting. But so, so you, why, why do you do that? Why do you have no, why do you have no score? Um, it's just a, it's a belief of mine. This comes a little bit from, I think probably the first people to push this to the fore. So there's this movement called, uh, and, 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 and maybe, maybe, uh, uh, Mike Fasolo knows this. What was it? The Dogma 96, the Dogma 97. Do you know what I'm talking about? So it was like Lars von Trier, uh, maybe, maybe Harmony Korine or Larry Clark, like a few different people made movies in this. And there were all these rules that were trying to get rid of some of the artifice of filmmaking and something actually prior to that, as I'd always felt was like movie scoring, um, is obviously coaxing emotion. And in, in, in most spots, it's like, let's heighten the suspense. Let's make a sad scene sadder. Let's, let's let everybody know this is a whimsical scene by putting some like pizzicato violin thing or whatever it's going to be. And, and, and my feeling is if I'm watching a scene in a movie that's supposed to be sad and it's not sad, and then there's music telling me it's sad, it's like insult to injury. It's making it worse. And uh, that sort of emotional cueing uh, is very standard. I mean, there are, there are movies out there uh, and, 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 and television shows that are far, far, far better than anything I've ever done that are loaded with that stuff. So it isn't to chop on that. That's just a, that is a technique and something I did not want to embrace. So Bone Tomahawk has a tiny bit of it, but it's really because some stuff fell short, like something that was supposed to be this giant canyon where characters are walking around and have this like really imposing feel a location that was supposed to be that in the movie is just some people it's, it's, it's David Arquette and Sid Haig just walking through a bunch of scr like, like bushes. So it doesn't have, the scene doesn't have the atmosphere that it was supposed to have because we couldn't get that location where we were shooting. Cause we were shooting in the wrong place. And, um, but that, that's what we could do on that budget and shooting at that speed. So there are a couple of spots in that movie that have a little bit of creepy music. That's kind of a, there's not a lot of score there. And in Braun Subak 999, um, where I was able to much better deliver what I wrote, uh, I'm using it primarily just for transitions uh, and dragged across co concrete. Although, you know, like that, certainly it was it was a very difficult shoot and there's some sequences that, that, I'm, that I'm not entirely happy with. I was able to mostly get all the pieces I needed and then not do it. And then I also write in diegetic score. So there are there is music going on in the movie but it is always coming from something within the world of the movie, not dropped on top of the movie to tell you it's sad. And I'll, I'll just, just an aside, I'll point to, there's, there's a, a Spielberg movie called Bridge of Spies. And it has a particularly excellent scene where Mark Rylance delivers this, this monologue and he's talking to Tom Hanks and the acting is great. The dialogue is fantastic. I believe the Coen brothers uh, did a polish on that, if not wrote all the dialogue. So the acting is great. The visuals are great. Um, the um, the the uh, all the dialogue is fantastic, and then there's sad music letting you know it's sad, and it for me it detracted from it. I thought it was, and, and that it lets you know it was important. I'm like, this works enough, so you have to have a little bit of trust. And certainly, this is something like when I did Bone Tomahawk, which is again very little score. Uh, and the next one, uh, like like a minute and a half of transitions, and this none. You just have to be like confident in the material and also okay if some people are like, this is boring, uh, which I've always been okay with. Like, I hope people enjoy it, but I'm not like, oh my gosh, someone might be bored for a moment or not know this is supposed to be scary. I need to put in scary music or not know this is supposed to be sad when this person is dying or this horse is, you know, just broken its legs or whatever. Like, I'm trusting that the material delivers it. And if it doesn't deliver it, I don't want to tell you what it's supposed to be. Yeah, Mike, I, I, I find this uh, argument a little bit specious. The guy's a trillionaire from yeah, Hollywood. Yeah, obviously. So he can call he can call all the shots. By the way, you got a compliment here from the audience, and, and we'll just we'll note Philip Burnett said, your work gets positive attention, which is better than most. Chuck Dixon was singing your praises regarding Brawl a month or so ago. How does that feel, um, Zoller, when you hear people like Chuck Dixon are seeing your work and – you know, or probably more importantly, that I was impressed with your work. How does that make you feel? 
<laughs> uh, it's 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 great. Um, uh, that it's it's meaningful when with, with 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 stuff like that. I'm trying to think the Chuck Dixon stuff that that I. So he wrote he wrote some Punisher, um, Robin, and he wrote. I'm trying like well, and, and and there was a he had a he had a uh, uh, Superman run. Was it with Ivan? Is, is it Reese or Rice? I don't know how to pronounce it. R e i s. And I think Dixon did that. Just, I, yeah, just, just that's spell cool. it. That's good. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that he that he enjoy that he enjoys stuff like that, and that all that stuff is is meaningful to me. You know. So, I, I, so going back now, um, you know, we who write comic books, um, we we fantasize all the time that someone in Hollywood will will discover our work and say, "Oh, I I want to buy it or I want to option it." When you put out your own work, are you aware that potentially you could put this up on the screen, or or is that not? part of what you're thinking about that's not what i'm thinking about at all for the for the comics i mean for like uh, i so i have the story for organisms from an ancient cosmos some version of this in terms of the core premises and some of how the science works and i like for me i really like i'm pretty strict on what i'm going to call science fiction and what i think is science fantasy or just like robots and people shooting each other and no kind of scientific sense of wonder like my favorite movie of all time is 2001 and um, I, that to me is a religious experience and it has that sense of wonder. But like more recently, something like Moon, that to me is a great science fiction movie. And it has that sense of like where you're just wondering how this scientific innovation affects what a human being is and identity and all that sort of stuff. So I want if I'm doing science fiction, it's going to it's going to um, go along those lines and it's not just going to be, you know, nonstop, nonstop action. And in terms of organisms from an ancient cosmos, you've read it. So there's quite a bit of science in it. Um, you know, discussion of particle physics and stuff like that going on. Uh, the digressions with the characters, that's also something that people, unless this were a television show, people would want to chop that stuff down. Certainly some stuff that's making, you know, one of the protagonists, like, um, certainly morally gray. Uh, and that studios would be very concerned about uh, people with scorecards coming out of a screening saying, oh, I don't like the lead character because he did X, Y, and Z or said X, Y, and Z. And I'm, I, that's not a concern of mine. Certainly you look at the, the, two, the two cops in Dragged Across Concrete, and I've seen every read on those characters and people who have an affinity for them or hate them and, all, and like in, in everything in between. Uh, and uh, I, I like the, 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 the first comic that I did, Forbidden Surgeries of the Hideous Dr. Davinus, this is really, yeah, I was reading a lot of pre-code horror stuff and I wanted to do something that was kind of like that, but also a lot of indie stuff. And I wanted to do something that, that had that. And there was no consideration of, would this be a show? And, and, um, uh, and with organisms from an ancient cosmos, I, I mean, I think it could be maybe a cool, a cool movie if the right person handled it. But I like the end, the end point for me has been reached. I definitely did not do this. So it could be a movie. Like I'm not spending like the amount of time I spent spent doing this. I could have written, I could have written eight screenplays in the amount of time, uh, in the amount of time that I did this. So if I right, wanted, so, but so that that, that I, I have to tell you, your audience is 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 pinging right now. So I I want so so by the way, sure, Chuck coming. Dixon uh, also wrote. I don't think Dixon wrote the nom. No, no, I, I don't, don't think so. But I know he co I know he co-created Bane. Uh, somebody named Max had a question for you, Zoller. What would you include on your sight and sound? What is a sight and sound list? Is that is this just like going to be favorite favorite movies? I don't know. I don't usually ask, do this. Ask, ask Max to clarify what that is. Yeah, is Max, just... what you, come on. What are you talking about, Max? Come on, Max. You're not even trying, Max. Not even trying. Argentina here from Argentina. Nice to meet you so one, this, one of one of the comic books that inspired me to do this that i think is maybe the greatest science fiction comic of all time i, I believe it's from argentina it's called uh the eternauts and it is incredible like that like top 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 line that is an absolute inspiration and one of the stepping stones to this and i believe it i believe it's from argentina um uh but i i, I might be a, i might be a country i might be a country off all right uh, so I said there were two things that I observed about your work, and I just thought that was very interesting. So I, I agree. I think moral ambiguity is probably a, a great strength of your writing, but that's not what I was observing. What I observed in both of your, uh, in your uh, Dragged Across Concrete film and your organisms 
uh, from an ancient cosmos graphic novel is that you will linger on a scene. Yes. That, like this seems to be like a thumbprint of yours. Talk about lingering. Oh, wait, hold on. This is, you get your very, your Eternot Osterhelv. Yeah. Os Osterhelv. I think he's, he's the writer of it. Oh, and, got it. and I read the, and I read the original version. I believe there's another version by a different, um, a different artist, but uh, that's, uh, you know, like he, 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 definitely if someone said, what are the best science fiction comic books out there? That's going to be top three, if not number one. And, uh, and, so and organisms from an ancient cosmos going to be on that list. Now talk to me about, talk to me about how you linger. Go ahead. Mike, was that good? Huh? Did I juggle that? That's good. A little right. callback. Well I done. Do comedy as all. Yeah. yeah, I do comedy. Me and Mike. <laughs> and do, we do comedy. Hold on. Here's proof that Mike does comedy. There he is toasting. And then let's go. Soller, talk about lingering on a scene. Um, so I, I you know, I know when I first started noticing stuff like that, and it was the one of my favorite filmmakers of all time, definite top ten all time uh, film director, uh, writer director, comedian, editor, artist, uh uh, Takeshi Kitano or Takeshi Kitano, I've heard it said multiple ways. Uh, he's absolutely brilliant. He's a, he's a huge inspiration of mine. And I remember seeing some of his movies and he's like, probably like Fireworks, is, uh, a AKA Hanabi is, is a movie that may maybe he's best known for that one in the United States. I'm not sure that one kids return dolls. These, these are, these are all great. Uh, and he had scenes where people would leave the scene and he's editing these movies and, and stars stars in a number of them and, and wrote them and just directing them. And he was a stand-up comedian. He's a, a fine artist, everything. Um, and he would have people leave the scenes and then the shot would just hold for a little bit longer. And it's, and it's sort of brought into, into my mind, the idea of like, Oh, the space existing beyond the immediate action of the characters and what you find when you when you linger, and and certainly if I didn't have Final Cut, there's no studio in the world that would have let me get away with like you know two minutes of Vince Vaughn eating a sandwich. Uh, and yet, for people who enjoy the movie, that's a highlight. For people who don't like it, this is more examples of my indulgent, like me being an indulgent shithead. Um, <laughs> but it, I think you live in that space in a different way when it's not the plot driving everything forward. And um, I find oftentimes like in, in my favorite works, plot is um, pretty low in terms of like what's driving. Like I like concepts and atmosphere and characterizations and surprises, but like that the juggernaut of the plot has to be serviced at all times is not something I agree with and, and never have. Um, and, and I could say like the script that launched my career insofar as a screenwriter and got me the three picture deal was something called the Brigands of Rattleboards, and it has a um, it has a an opening sequence um, that sort of sets up a plot element, and then it has sixty five pages of you're hanging out in a town and really no plot is moving forward. They're talking about pies, getting a bonus, pork chops, and stuff like that, and then shit happens. But to me, it was like putting the love and the life into the characterization and into their world. So when something happened, the impact was all the greater. And, and you know, certainly you, you can see it in one of my movies in terms of, uh, and, and I won't get into details for those who haven't seen it, the whole Jennifer Carpenter sequence and Dragged Across the Country. Like if you don't spend the time there, um, there your investment in that character is less. So Unbelievable. I've, I, I, have to, I was, they, wasn't sure. Well, And so as a viewer, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And then and I, I have to tell you, I think on the second time I was watching it, like I started to get where you were going, and I and I think it. And then I read your graphic novel, and in the graphic novel, there are places where, let's face it, Mike and I would have taken shortcuts. We wouldn't have drawn as much as you did, but you just sat there and kept building that thing, and you had that linger in a different way. What you had on celluloid took time. What this was was took space, and what it was just I admired was your patience in just drawing out scenes that other artists might have, I don't know, put on one panel and just sort of suggested it in a montage. Sure. I mean, you really put the work into this. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I do. And and some of it is because I feel all of those clippings, uh, you know, if there's one note that I've rallied against and had a disagreement with every time I've received it for all of those pieces that are that are sitting at the studios, 
uh, it is that every scene must be in service of the plot. I, I couldn't fundamentally disagree with that more. And um, it, it is, uh, it, it's, it's just something like, I want the world of the movie or the book or the comic to be larger than the plot. I want you to have a sense that it takes place in a real place where shit happens other than the events of the movie or the comic or the book. So, so that, that's just- Gomez says, Katano is great at lingering on scenes. I get a similar feeling from your action sequences as I do films like Santine and Hana. I don't know that. Yeah, Hana, Hana. Does, yeah. that does this make sense to you? It, 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 abs- it absolutely does. And that, I mean, there's something with um, that lingering is, is some of the space you're talking about that makes it feel a little bit more art house. But the violence that he handles is he's doing it in a pretty unvarnished way. There, uh, like it, it's not. Let's go in for a ton of close-ups. Let's really stretch it out. You know, like a John Woo or Sam Peckinpah thing. And those are two directors I adore. But it's not. They're they're not um, in terms of the stylistic choices they make in in influence upon what, what I want to do. I want like I want the like I, I want that violence and stuff like that to be presented in a similar way to the dialogue so it feels a part of the whole not now we're ramping up into an action scene and there's going to be a lot of heavy metal music going uh and in a you know like in you know double gunning slow motion across this you know like on all I, I want i want every movie to have, i want the, like commercials to have that <laughs> i want commercials to have that and i love like again like john woo was a hero of mine in film school like i went to film school 91 95 he was certainly one one of the gods and i still adore his work but not everyone who does something is going to it like directly influence me and i could say what john woo does does not uh right, so you know i adore it here's a comment from uh mark hoppent or mark mark caper carper adapting a comic to a movie is very difficult even when the narrative is sometimes similar can you talk about adapting a narrative from a page so you take like a watchman Right. When you think about what it takes from adapting something from the page to the screen, I don't care specifically about what comic you would want to make into a movie. I'll tell you all the things I don't care about. <laughs> but I'll, but what I care about is tell me what in your mind is that adaptation from a comic book page to the screen? What are the similarities and differences? So it's 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 tough because like for me, uh, I mean, I've got, you can probably see some stuff in the background. I've, I've, I've been reading comics uh, my whole life. I, I will admit to reading fewer in the 90s. Uh, and, I, and I think there are some obvious reasons for that. But like 80, 80s and, and 2000 forward, tons of comics. 90s, 90s a little, a little <laughs> less. And um, in general, I'm not, in, I don't go see the comic book, comic book movies. It's not like, I, I, I think there are things that work on the page. I think smart aleck dialogue while you're having fisticuffs and punching each other and playful and that sort of stuff because it's stylized and it's hand drawn and and you know you have these people in the skin tight suits and moving around. Uh, I think there are things that work on the comic page that uh, don't work in live action movies, which is why you get all these guys wearing like armor and black leather and you get every Batman looks like he's just had whiplash and, <laughs> and I can't like it's like you know, like, it's like has lockjaw. So like, I don't like, I, I mean, I thought that that recent bat, the Batman was the terrible, like the unwatchably bad garbage. And um, so I don't see most of them. Uh, it's not, re- it's not really, it's not really for me. Sorry if, if you're friends with the, the people who the wrote that or, um, you know, or, or, or whatever. But uh, so I don't, I don't see most of those movies. So in terms of like, for me, it's like some of the stuff that's designed to be on the comic page works best on the comic page. And, and I can, I suppose I can only speak to something like maybe History of Violence, but I only saw the movie and it worked well as a movie. Uh, but I imagine if I go back to the source material, that's going to have its own special kind of atmosphere. And, I, you know, some of why I read comics is people could tell different types of stories. But some of it is that just like the pure joy of looking at hand-drawn illustration, which obviously is something that, um, you know, like, translates to the kind of animation I like and that you you know you lose you lose with CG. So I don't really have a great answer for what it takes to adapt something um, from the comic book page to, to a movie um, because I don't know how many times I've seen it and, and enjoyed it. And for the most part, like the whole like uh, like superhero zeitgeist that we're dealing with in terms of this is what's coming out of the studios. I'm not the, the demographic for that and I don't and I don't see those movies. So for solo since we're going by last name today, Fasolo, 
You are a screenwriter, a mega award-winning screenwriter who looks great in a sweatshirt. <laughs> you are a peer. I, I saw your reaction when he was like, oh, I sold 20-something screenplays and I had a three-picture deal. This does this isn't an everyday thing, right, Mike? This is no, not this is this is not something that you just go, oh, I wrote a movie, and then they go, oh, great, here's a three-picture deal. That's epic. That's fantastic. It's like how how did you do that? That's that to me is the real Write story. Write it down and send it to Mike. Yes. Well, I again, it was that script brings a rod aboard, which is this uh, NC-17 nasty Western that was like 150 pages and broke every rule, as everyone, you know, told me. And I had, you know, a lot of like at that point, um, it just, it you know, I got this deal at, at, at Warner Brothers and I had um, in, a, in like that first year, I had lots of meetings with very famous people and lots of conversations. And then kind of all their handlers are like, oh, this dude is going to say whatever's on his mind. Like, you know, like, and it isn't like, like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not mean about it, but if someone gives me an idea I don't like, I'll say why I don't like it. And, um, and if I think the, you know, something works well as I've conceived it, I'll explain why, why I think it works well. So I have a lot of conviction uh, with it. And also I can generate an amount of material so that like once a script of mine starts going south at a studio in the development process, adios, I'll just go write something else. Um, so, you know, I said like I, I, if 23 is the number, that, that, that's probably that's probably a good number. A bunch of television pilots, uh, a bunch of features. And I have a couple in turn around that I'm trying to make uh, now as a director. And that, that's a, that's a whole other story. But, uh, you know, they didn't get made. And, and, and I'm, it's, I'm not blameless in that uh, in that process because I'm not really that amenable to doing anything that I think isn't good. And the writing, I think, was I mean. I, I did I did go to school to become a director uh, and like eventually it was going to go in that direction, but it might have taken longer had um, some of the directors and actors who got on board some of my material actually made those things as opposed to just sit on it or sit on it and have development talks and, and, and that sort of thing. But I, like I just generate a lot of material and I and I, you know, like I said, if it's 23 pieces, but I've also written 54, 55 scripts somewhere in somewhere in that ballpark so it's a pretty good batting average in terms of you know in the first six or seven where i learned my craft most of those are not good though one of those was made and i rewrote it later so it became better but it was a called incident at sands asylum and it was made it was the first thing of mine made and it was made as asylum blackout uh and there are aspects of it i like and and aspects of it that i don't uh, it's something it's not something where I'm like I'm ashamed this is out and has my name on it there's a stupid gimmick that was that I was never willing to write that they just added that the movie completely didn't need at the end but outside of that I think it has some of the tone of what I was originally doing and was fairly autobiographical at that time as it was about like people who worked in a kitchen who were like playing in a metal band like that was my life <laughs> like, I worked in a kitchen and I played in a metal band so Mike the trick is to get a three picture deal that's yeah, obviously, your, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give that a shot tomorrow. I'm gonna go, uh, go do. Yeah, it Mike and I are just tired of failing with our with our scripts and our ideas. Zoller, we're gonna go. We're gonna do what you did. So, Mike, you be a chef. I'll get in a death metal band, and we'll get running. <laughs> Problem Let's solved. Let's growl, buddy. Let me let, let me hear the growl. Let me hear the death metal growl. <laughs> yeah! That's that's the good starting point. But you said you were a chef in a death metal band, and I kind of thought, well. Are you a sh the chef in the death metal? Is, is that, do you wear a costume as a chef? Because that would be a good mashup, I think. That would be a good mashup. And I was more of a cook than a chef. There was an executive chef, and I and I I cooked I cooked under him. You were the sous um, chef. I, I, I it, it's it was a catering company, which is what I wanted to do, so I could still take time off to like direct plays, which I was doing at the time, and work as a cinematographer, which I was also doing at the time. So I was. I was trying to do something where I could you like take my... stuff like it's nothing, Mike. Yeah, you have you have, you're a chef. You're in a death metal band. You want to want to do catering. You write movies. You write. He wrote, no wrote novels. He's made a new <laughs> soundtrack. I feel like I'm standing still. I'm going to allow one fanboy question, uh, Zoller, and hold on. Oh yeah, got to grow hair the hair back out or go full Yul Brenner. I will. I'm going to go full Yul Brenner. Uh, Jack has a question. Have you written any scripts that weren't genre films or any straight up dramas, or does that not interest you? 
I I did. Uh, I wrote two that were dramas, and um, one isn't very good. I wrote it really early on, and then the other the other one. I guess it has some creepy stuff around the edges, and um, so I I don't think I don't think you could call it a like it's something like let's say something like Roman Polanski's. Um, um, repulsion or something like that, or the tenant, where there's like some kind of horror around the edges, but uh, overall, it's it's a drama. It it does interest me, but it isn't like I, not more than the than the things that I'm currently doing. Yeah, I'm uh, Mike knows. I primarily like um, deeply violent movies, right, Mike? And Mike likes time travel, so we pretty much do. We work together. We don't like any of the same stuff. So, Zara, one question that I ask at the end of the show for each of the guests, and that is, what is one piece of it? Oh, hold on a few minutes. All right, what, one more. We gotta let him follow up. You mentioned you wrote a sitcom. What was that premise, JL? The sitcom was called Power Chords, and it was, and it took place in two different. And this one I sold to FX, so they, I have, they have. Four. Obviously, yeah, just, just no, no, but like it, it, but it didn't get made. Like, this is a thing, like, there's a point yeah. at which none of this stuff is being taken to completion. So, it's great in terms of my like financial stability and why I could then take 14 months off to do something like this. Um, and uh, so it's great in, in, in so far as you know that goes, but they're not made. I mean, until I started making my own things, with two exceptions, none of my stuff was made, yeah. But so, you, you, you the, the operative word was you, you sold a script. Right. To FX. I, I believe, Mike, uh, you had a script at FX, which you just flung into a dumpster. Yeah, it was, was, it was pretty... like a, a drive by. I just had to throw, fling it out the window as it drove into by a dumpster. Yeah, you got paid nothing for it. <laughs> we tried, though. All right. So, Zoller. So, so oh, just to, so Power Chords, it was about um, it was two timelines. And, and actually, this is I don't have that many things about musicians. Actually, we're, we're, we're discussing the two. But this was like these, these heavy metal guys and they're kind of young and brash and like really arrogant and, um, and their band is on the way up and how they're, how they're interacting. And then also 20 years later after the, you know, they, like they've settled into a lot, their lives and more middle age and where they're at. And it was a, it was a, it, I mean, it was a comedy, but just, it was like you were constantly going back and forth between them at like, age whatever 21 22 and them in their 40s at different points of their lives so that that was that was the sitcom thing uh, and then I, had a, I had another one that was um essentially the despicable me idea uh and i actually got a great like the the showrunner for uh modern family uh got on board that at the time and i thought it was going to go and it didn't uh so actually i, I had two sitcoms uh and, the, and that one i didn't sell but like kind of almost did uh, but, but power chords I did, and it's just sitting in FX. You are a productive yes. worker, and I admire your output. Uh, and one question that we asked to all of our guests is, what is one piece of advice you wish you had received earlier in your career? Hmm. I mean, it's just something I learned uh, pretty uh, pretty early on once I started having success. But I'd say just use anything that you do, any work that you make, be it an album or a comic or a movie uh, or, or a book, uh, it should be something that you would enjoy yourself. Um, because the thing where you're just like hunting the audience and you just have like a net and you hope you're catching someone or someone's into your gimmick or whatever, that's kind of an empty experience when you finished writing that or creating that. Um, but if you've done something that you enjoy yourself, even if no one wants it, and I have, you know, like a pile of stuff that didn't go anywhere. Albums from a first band that no one ever wanted to put out, scripts that aren't particularly good, some that I think are pretty good, but still nobody wanted. And, uh, but there's, you'll find, I think having that satisfaction uh, is, is is really important to, to go through. And, and maybe the other advice is share your work with people. If you are really too precious about it or so concerned that people are going to steal it, you won't see people's reactions to it. And certainly 
I remember sending out a screenplay of mine for Incident at Sands Asylum to a screenplay contest. This is back in the catering chef days. And I got a reply from uh, the contest and they, in the, 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 the woman who ran the contest suggested I see a therapist because the script was, the script was evidence of, of all of my, of, of all of my mental shortcomings and derangements. And, uh, you know, like obviously a really, really limited perspective in a, in a pretty shitty thing to say, but like, I, I, I knew what I wanted to do. I made something, I'm like, I want this horror piece to be a dehumanizing experience. And later in my career, Tobey Hooper, um, you know, director, uh, creator of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, read it, and I had a conversation with him, and he said, this is the scariest screenplay. This is one of the scariest screenplays I've ever read, if not the scariest. And he was certainly an inspiration on it. Uh, at the time, people weren't up for financing it or whatever. It didn't happen with him for whatever reason, and it became a silent blackout. Uh, but uh, that sort of thing where you're just, as long as, like, it as long as you're not just chasing what you think people want, you're going to get some self-satisfaction. And I think that's really important. If all your satisfaction comes from people's reactions to it on the outside, that I, I think that can be pretty frustrating. But you obviously need some some reinforcement. If all you're doing is just, you know, creating stuff in, in your home, then, then, like, then at a certain point you're kind of becoming an outsider, you know, outsider artist. You might just have your piles of stuff that people discover when you've passed away. Hmm. Mike, we have to stop being so shallow. Yeah, I know. I'm gonna I'm gonna wait for the me be discovered after I'm dead. <laughs> so we were here with uh, Zoller. I'm gonna just pull up your graphic novel real quick so people can see this. We're gonna go like uh, do this. I'm gonna make it. Can I do push it? The, push the I can do it. I can do it. <laughs> uh, Organisms from an ancient cosmos out today. Uh, so. Um, if you're in California, there might still be time to get to the comic shop. Uh, a fun and twisty and unexpected epic graphic novel for those who enjoy science fiction. But I think it's much more than that. It's a science fiction setting, but it's really a story about people. Uh, I do want to jump slightly ahead. So I'm going to just do the little thing over here. And I'm going to say you can learn more uh, about the director at his website, scraigzoller.com. Com. Craig, where, where can they find you? What, could, what should they be looking for? What We know about the graphic novel. What else should they be checking out? Um, uh, well, there's, you know, there's the precursor graphic novel, which is a <laughs> uh, thing. Forbidden and where search. can they get that? What? Where can they get that? Um, you can definitely get it from Floating World Comics, uh, which is which is the place that published it, and some comic book stores uh, have it, and, and some are out of stock. It's uh, I don't know how many how many were printed, but you, you can find it in different spots. My most recent novel is uh, called The Slanted Gutter. Uh, so those who want uh, crime stuff, and uh, this is certainly my most intricately intricately plotted piece. Uh, so those who are looking for that sort of experience, I look like. You know Jim Thompson, David Goodis, mm. Higgins, that whole that whole world. Um, certainly, if you've seen my movies, you might expect that the violence is going to get nastier than you'll find in those, and you would be correct. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of like kind of twisty stuff, and uh, so that's out there. And I just um, after ten months, uh, uh, like six weeks ago, just finished writing uh, my newest novel, which I am uh, you know starting to take around, and that is a work of high fantasy. Uh, written in a different style than my my other my other novels, um, and almost like a like a Bronte sister style. So it's uh, a bit archaic uh, in that, and so that's something I'll be taking around uh, as well. You also uh, sell for a very reasonable price your uh, film screenplays on your website. Oh, yeah, that yeah. was very that was very nice of you to put that out there for people. Yeah, um, I, I get I, I got enough requests for it that I just put them on there. So it's I think it's like. 250 or 275 uh, for for a script, and you can uh, and you can see it, like I I'm, I, I, I think uh, like Bone Tomahawk I think is on there and Brawl and Subbuck 99. So when I say that these are very very accurate, the movie to the original script, uh, you can you can find out you can find out for yourself in there and they're there. Mike, you should sell your screenplays like yes. period. Just yeah. try to sell something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Zoller, it was a great pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for joining us and talking about your graphic novel and, of course, your film work. It is a 
real pleasure. And I hope you come back, uh, spend a little bit more time with us when you have something else uh, that you want to share. Sure. Thank you very much for having me. It was, it was fun. Um, good luck with, with winging those scripts at, uh, at FX and stuff like that. And, and again, like, you know, my success story, it's allowed me to do stuff like this. Like all of that shit that I sold in Hollywood allows me to do 14 months of, you know, like being a 40, you know, 48 year old <laughs> turning 49 year old um, guy trying to improve his comic book skills. So it's something I always wanted to do. And uh, yeah, and, and, and unlike a lot of people who work in film and comics, I did it because I want to do comics. It's not, I didn't do, no one, like, I'm not spending that amount of time doing something like that because I want it to be a movie. It, like, if someone turns it into a movie, cool. But, like, the, the end, the end, like, the end goal was to do this comic that I, you know, that I wrote and, you know, that I wrote and drew and, and did by myself. And, and I didn't have the limitations and the parameters set by making, a, a, you know, a motion picture where you're just doing so much managerial stuff and constantly dealing with all the variables of uh, film production. Yeah, and and of course, uh, suffering through working with Mel Gibson, Vince Vaughn, you know, Kurt Russell. I feel badly for you having <laughs> to do all that. Hold on here real quick. That was awesome. So, Philip Burnett, thank you. Um, somebody just wanted to say, any news on your next project? Anything? Uh, none, nothing, nothing that I can give out right now. I've got four, let's say I've got four irons in the fire, but I don't know what will land. I had for, for a time, it looked like my next movie was going to be um, Hug Chicken Penny that based actually based on that novel uh, that I wrote and I had an amazing cast uh, and the, but the lead character was going to be a puppet made by the Jim Henson company they were on board I had a fantastic cast but people are like oh the bone tomahawk dragged across concrete guy is going to do like a three hour orphan fable <laughs> and starring a puppet so people were people were uh, a, a bit wary of financing that one. So some of the other things um, are, are, are going to be easier for people to understand. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have you down as a as a definite maybe for the Mary Poppins reboot. <laughs> I don't know that I'm getting on board that one. Yeah, I don't know. So I'm gonna put you in the uh, in the green room. Please don't go away. Stay there. Mike uh, has bought uh, 14 pounds of Skittles, and see how many you can get through uh, before you drive in drop into a sugar coma. We're going to put you backstage. I will see you soon. And Mike, um, he makes it sound so easy. He does, it, which that's what's amazing about it. He's just like, oh, yeah, I got a three picture deal with. Oh, uh, yeah, I got Vince Vaughn in a movie. Oh, yeah, I got Mel Gibson and Kurt. It's like, it's like I could just call it Mel Gibson and be like, hey, Mel, you want to be in a movie? Know, yeah. Like, yeah, okay. And I think that that it, uh, still be better than Meet the Feebles, I guess. I don't even know what Meet the Feebles is. I don't is. know what that is, but yeah, that, that sounds terrible. But if he, if Philip comes on and says anything, I always put him on. But what I what I was impressed with, and then I have to tell you, Mike, like as I'm looking through Zoller's website, I'm like, how much does this guy have like 30, 35 hours in a day? I mean, how does he get so much done? And then if you look yes. behind him, you're gonna pull him back up on screen here, really. Look at all the stuff behind him. Look at all. <laughs> he's got books. He's got movies. He's got stuff. He's not just sitting. I have books and stuff, and yet I get nothing done. Yeah, I, I, I sit around all day. I wish I could have his, his drive to get all that stuff done, which is This guy amazing. is inc it's incredible. It is. Fantastic. And then he's like, oh, I'm speaking truth to the studio. They spoke truth. If I spoke truth to the studio, they have me ex escorted out. This guy gets a three-picture deal. <laughs> And then he's made movies with Mel Gibson and uh, Kurt Russell and Vince Vaughn's been in a couple of movies with him. And he still, I would just be on a boat somewhere. <laughs> well, I you know, after you, after you spend all your trillions, you know, you might, you come back down to earth. Hold on, let me just see. Are you in a boat? <laughs> I'm not in a boat. I'm in my apartment loaded with all the stuff that I enjoy. <laughs> I, I will explain what, one of the, one of the reasons, like, because, because I do produce a lot of stuff and have, um, I, I've just always had a really good work ethic. I enjoy my time off. So one of the things that I can't enjoy my day if I'm working until I've done my work. So some of the drive is I want to have time off. Like after the 10 months of writing this, that last book, I'm taking some months off and just enjoying, enjoying comics. Like right now I'm reading, what the hell am I? I'm reading some Lone Wolf and Cub. I'm reading some Punisher Max. I'm reading some American Splendor. I'm reading some New Yorker encyclopedia of cartoons. So that's, I really enjoy my time off, but I have to be completely done with my project to enjoy it fully. 
Yeah, so that's I'm, a, I'm gonna get. I'm, I'm gonna the opposite. It. I don't enjoy working until I enjoy my time off. <laughs> well, everyone has their own thing. It works for you. Well, and you have three. And you have three Emmys. I have zero. And yeah, I don't yeah you, 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 Mike, you got three Emmys. Zala, you're going to have to do some uh, reading of uh, Apocalypse Boulevard. I'll send that over to you. <laughs> you just hand that to Vince Vaughn. Going to push him back into that. Guy's probably a trillionaire. He, what, he just seems like he's a nice, normal, but he's probably rich beyond your wildest dreams. I have, I have, I have big dreams, dreams, but <laughs> We were talking about scene lingering, and I was like, the difference between lingering and loitering, right? Like when we go to In and Out Burger, I loiter, right? Lingering and stalking. <laughs> lingering and loitering. So, Mike, um, final thoughts on on what you what you heard tonight? Because you were a little bit on the quiet side. Apparently, I need a better work ethic. Those are my final thoughts, at least for me. I got to get doing some more stuff. Yeah, I think uh, Zoller's an inspiration, and when when I saw that this guy. Obviously, obviously very successful, could delegate someone else, go draw this. And he did it himself. He like that to me was this guy wanted to, he re actually wanted to do it. Yeah. Like I don't want to, like I don't proactively look for work. I don't go out there I, and rake. I, I tell people to rake because I'm exactly. like, oh, I'm rich. I'm not raking anymore. If I could it, just come up with an idea and say, here, somebody else go write it, that would be the best thing ever. Like, yeah, I would just, yeah, I would have other people bathe me, whatever they, <laughs> if I had that much money. So anyway, Mike, uh, I hope this episode inspired you. It did. It was fantastic. I hope it inspired you and hoping it got you to want to work harder and for me to work harder as well, but also just like really focus on, you know, doing what you love. Because obviously this guy brings a lot of love into it. It's not oh, yeah. like he... The, he didn't have to do this. He did it because he loved it. He makes music because he loves it. He writes novels. And I think they all cross pollinate. And he was a chef because he loved it. He was a chef. He was the heavy metal. Um, <laughs> what was it? Catering chef. Every metal catering chef. Mike, next week we have Kathy. We're going to be talking about writing and ADHD and techniques that will improve your craft of the writing of comic books and help you reach the finish line. I will see you again next week. And boom. Boom. <laughs>